Well, good morning and welcome to worship here at Palmdale United Methodist Church, where we are inspired by Jesus of love. I'm Pastor John, one of the pastors here. Uh, we'll be starting worship in just a few moments, but until then, uh, my prayer for us is that God may, we may experience God's presence afresh. Uh, we've got a wonderful new series that we've started for this month uh, called New Beginnings, and so I'm very excited to see how God creates new beginnings in each and every one of your lives and in the life of our community. Hope that you'll be sharing stories with me and Pastor Jim about what God is doing in your life. But in the meantime, I just invite you to hang tight. We'll be starting worship in just about five minutes.
Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Welcome to Palmdale United Methodist Church's live stream service. Uh, those that have joined us here in the pews and those that have joined us online, welcome. We're going to start our service off with hymn number 577, God of Grace and God of Glory. Would you please stand and join us? With the children online and my buddy Noah, please come forward this morning. Morning, Noah. Morning, saints in the congregation. Great to see you, but Noah, I am so excited. I. I know you like Oreos, right? Double stuff Oreos. Here, I've been working on something, juggling, for a few months. If I can get this done, we are eating Oreos, all right? Oh. Actually, I drank a lot before the service. I really have to go to the bathroom. I'll be right back. Pastor John, can you take over for me? Thanks. Okay. <laughs> Well, <laughs> let's see here. What's that? Just eat the cookies? So we just go straight to the cookies? I feel like that would be, I mean, there's juggling balls here. There's no instructions, but I'm assuming you have to juggle to get the cookies, right? Noah, do you know how to juggle? No? 
Anybody online know how to juggle? I, I, I've juggled in the past before, but I'm not a great juggle. Let's see how we can do, okay? Uh, so I know you had to create a little box, and you throw it up to the left-hand box, and as that one hits the left-hand box, you throw the next one to the right-hand box. So, <laughs> something like that. And then, oh, okay, that's good enough. Right, something like that. And then, I know that there is like a thing where you can throw it over to the, oh, there's a thing where you can throw it to the other way, but I can't do it very well. So I'll just stick to the traditional. We'll do a little tiny, small juggle, as small as I can possibly get. And then big, and then gigantic. And that's about a, well, uh, we're, we're gone with that. Okay. So, you know, first of all, let's get to the main thing, Oreos. Would you like an Oreo, Noah? How about two Oreos? Or how about three, since we've got three juggling balls? Oh, which reminds me, what's that? You had three? Yeah, you had three. That, that's okay. Well, while we're waiting on Pastor Jim, this happened to just remind me of a story, which was from uh, the scripture that we're reading today. It's from Joshua. And it's a story where the people of Israel have been journeying through the wilderness for 40 years, looking to this final day when they would arrive at the promised land. And just as they reached the edge of the promised land, the guy that had been guiding them for that entire time, Moses, dies. And all of a sudden, they have to appoint a new leader to take them into the promised land, a guy named Joshua. And I bet you, you know, Joshua is probably a little bit nervous and terrified of suddenly having to take over the reins after Moses has been doing this amazing job of leading them. And maybe it came as a little bit of a shock and a little bit of a surprise, but he had to figure it out. And he had to trust that God would lead the way, even when people leave you at the front of the stage with a couple juggling balls, a few juggling balls and some Oreos, you trust that God will lead the way. And in fact, God told Joshua, be strong and courageous. So Noah, I don't know what's going on in your life right now, or for those that are worshiping online, those kids, maybe you've got something big that's facing you, a huge test, uh, a big decision, um, I don't know what it could possibly be, but God is telling you today, be strong and courageous and know that I am God. Amen? Amen. All right, let's go to God in a time of prayer. Thank you, God, that you are the one who leads us into new territory, even when we're not sure what we'll find, even when we're not sure how we'll get there or what it will take for us to make it there. We trust, oh God, that you are the one who will make us strong and courageous, that will give us what we need to live into the vision that you've called us to live into. We pray, O oh God, for each and every one of these kiddos that are worshiping online and for Noah, Lord, that they may know that you are with them, that they may know that your presence is there for them to make them strong and courageous. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <laughs> I just opened my eyes and I just oh. found you eating your... Oreos, perfect. Okay, well. I'll take this. What's that? I'll take this. Okay. <laughs> All right, thank you, Noah. Thank you, kids online. <laughs> Gotta brush up on my juggling skills. Um, so, as we are moving into a time of announcements, I've got a few things that you might want to be aware of, first of all, today after church, uh, right at one, around one o'clock, they are having the next group, uh, next meeting for lunch church. It's a small group where the focus is simply to get together, eat lunch, have great conversation, maybe talk about what God is doing in your life, maybe talk about the, uh, the obstacles that are facing you in 2024, or whatever it might be. The goal is just to have some good, genuine, honest conversation and connect. If you've never been a part of a small group at our church here before, this is a great way to get involved. So Lunch Church at 1, they're going to be meeting across the street at California Fish Grill, which is right behind Krispy Kreme. So afterwards, you can head over to Krispy Kreme and grab yourself some donuts to bring home. Uh, this coming Wednesday, we've, we're, we've started a new Food for Thought series. It's called Short Spirituality. 
uh, spiritual insights from Pixar short films. So if you've, some of you might be familiar with Pixar short films, they're like four or five minutes long. Some of them are, it's amazing what kind of incredible message that they can send in just a few short minutes. Uh, they're full of so many wonderful insights. And so for this series, uh, up until the beginning of Lent, we'll be going through, uh, we'll be visiting a new Pixar short film and then connecting it with a, a story from Scripture and talking about how does it help bring that story to life and what is it saying to us now. So that's going to be for the next uh, handful of Wednesdays before Lent starts. A week from today, uh, on Sunday, at, uh, uh, which is the 21st at 4 o'clock, we'll be doing our Ignite Christmas party. We don't have an Ignite youth group meeting today, but next week we'll have a sort of delayed uh, or a belated Christmas party since, as you know, there's, the holidays are so packed with so many different things that are happening. So we decided to push it back until January. So at 4 o'clock next, when, or next Sunday, we'll be doing our youth Christmas party, and we hope that you'll join us for that. I'll be putting out more information soon. Uh, speaking of our youth, we've got winter camp just around the corner. If you've ever been up to Wrightwood, California, it is one of the most beautiful, incredibly uh, majestic and uh, peaceful places that you can go to. It's up in the mountains. There have been some winters where it actually snows. I went to one winter camp where it snowed. It was magical. Um, but whether it snows or not, it is always an incredibly impactful, wonderful weekend of connecting with God making new friends, playing fun games, learning all kinds of things. And so that's President's Day weekend, February 17th through 19th, and the time to register is now. They've got the, they, they reserved the upper camp for the elementary kids, and they reserved the lower camp for the junior high and senior high kids. And so talk to me or Pastor Jim if you'd like more information about that. Uh, and as we move into a time of prayer, we always like to highlight some churches in the North District that we can be in covenant prayer with, uh, keep it in mind uh, the larger body of Christ that we are part of. And so this Sunday, we lift up Santa Clarita Korean Mission, uh, which is just down the road from us, and also St. James United Methodist Church. Let's uh, commit to praying for their congregations this week and for their pastors and for the wonderful works of ministry that they're doing. Let's go now to God in a time of prayer. O oh God of new beginnings, may today, may this week, may this new year be the start of a renewed relationship with you, both as individuals and as a community of faith. Lead us into this new year with eyes wide open wider than they've ever been. Lord, eyes open to the darkened corners of our heart that have been collecting dust, that need attention, that are awaiting your revival. Places, oh God, where have become blind spots in our life that are places where new life can flourish. Open up our eyes to the needs around us, the places where our love can reach among our neighbors and coworkers and friends, places that we thought perhaps that we might never have anything to offer, but through your strong and courageous spirit, we might find ourselves, Lord, working in areas of ministry that we never thought possible. Open up our eyes, O oh God, to encountering your presence in our lives so that you, the holy and living God who resurrects and reignites may create a new beginning among us today. God, as a people who believe that this can happen, we're committed to walking alongside one another in ensuring, oh God, that we can walk together in this vision. We lift up our hearts and our voices together, praying the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray, saying, 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And thank you for filling in for me for Children's Time. Appreciate it. As we move into our time of stewardship, I want to share a verse from, a couple verses from Matthew chapter 6. Jesus said, Therefore do not worry, saying, What will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who strive for all these things. And indeed, your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these things will be given to you as well. I've been listening to our uh, church podcast, our unofficial church podcast, Methodist to the Madness, uh, which you can download on any of the places you get your podcast from. But Jessica, Beth, and Tim do a fabulous job every week. They check in with each other. They uh, mention the upcoming events at the church. There's a ministry moment of one aspect of our church's outreach. Then they discuss the most recent Sunday sermon, and they close with prayer concerns for one another. And often they all have a guest that comes in to talk about the ministry moment and to share as well. Well, the, most, the two most recent episodes have, have uh, dropped uh, during this New Year time. And so, as you might expect, the topic of New Year's resolutions has come up uh, more than once. I won't divul divulge which of the three confessed to not making any New Year's resolutions this year. You'll have to listen to that yourself. But it got me thinking, what does the Bible say about uh, what our priorities should be? Not just at the new year, but all the time. And that led me to this passage from Matthew chapter 6. Uh, evidently, worrying has been around for quite some time. And Jesus acknowledges questions like, uh, what are we going to eat or drink or wear? It's questions that, those types of questions people have struggled with for centuries. And he basically says, God knows that you need all of those things. Don't worry about them. Instead, make your focus, make your priority, make your resolution seeking God's kingdom. Seeking God's kingdom. For me, I, that means allowing God, allowing your heart to break for the things that break God's heart, uh, to reach out to those in need, to find opportunities to love others, uh, even or especially when it's difficult, to go out of your way, to put others first, and to give God your full support and allegiance. One of the ways that we as people of faith express our support and allegiance to God and God's kingdom is by sharing our financial resources uh, with, with which we've been blessed. And as this is the uh, stewardship moment in the service, I'm inviting you to, to give resources back to God. Not because uh, we need it, not because you uh, are obligated to, but out of response of, of putting God's kingdom first. We say it every week, the easiest way to give digitally is through our church app. You can also give by sending a text message to this number, 833-641-6929. Follow the prompts if you'd like to give digitally. Uh, we have offering boxes here in the sanctuary and in the lobby, and many, uh, especially those worshiping online who aren't giving digitally, are sending in checks every week. We're grateful uh, for that. As we move squarely into this new year, may we have an opportunity to reassess and refocus our priorities. And know that God knows what it is that we need. And God knows the challenging situations that some of us are facing right now. And God invites us to seek God's kingdom first. Everything else will fall into place. Amen. I invite you now to rise in body or, and, or in spirit as the scripture passage is read for us by Mike Butler. Oh, sorry. You may be seated. I forgot. It's Martin Luther King uh, Jr. weekend. We have a video uh, reminding and focusing on that, and then we'll move into our scripture. Thank you, Don.
Dr. King was definitely someone who sought first the kingdom of God. Now let us rise as we hear the scripture reading for us. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the Old Testament book of Joshua, chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, My servant Moses is dead. Now proceed to cross the Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I am giving to them, to the Israelites. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon I have given to you, as I promised Moses. From the wilderness and the Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea in the west shall be your territory. No one shall be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall put this people in possession of the land that I swore to their ancestors to give to them. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to act in accordance with all the law that my servant Moses commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, so that you may be successful wherever you go. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. You may be seated. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, you who are indeed our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, I know not many of you are as big of a sports fan as I am, and I try not to inflict uh, sports analogies or insights in my sermons upon you too often, but this has been a big week in football. Uh, both for a number of reasons. First of all, Michigan Wolverines won the 2024 College National Football Championship, uh, capping an undefeated season of 15-0 and 0 with a 34-13 win over the Washington Huskies. Now, it's also been significant because there were three major coaching changes. Pete Carroll stepped down as the Seattle Seahawks head coach after 14 years and one Super Bowl championship. Nick Saban announced his retirement as the head coach of Alabama after 17 years at the helm, uh, where he amassed uh, nine SEC championships, um, 11 if you count his time at LSU, um, or, or, uh, and six national championships, an additional one at LSU. And over the course of his career, 12, 123 players uh, from, uh, from his 
programs were drafted into the NFL. He's considered by many to be the greatest college coach, football coach of all time. And then in the NFL, uh, Bill Belichick announced he's leaving New England after 24 years and six Super Bowl titles. So it's been a crazy week for football fans. Now, you don't need to know much about sports to know this is going to be really challenging uh, for whoever steps into the shoes of those three coaches, especially Nick Saban in Alabama and Bill Belichick in New England after winning so many championships. By the way, after I wrote uh, this intro to my sermon, both jobs were filled. Uh, the Alabama job went to the Washington Huskies coach uh, and a former Patriot player and current assistant, uh, Jared Mayo, is taking over New England. Anyway, all that to say, welcome to the second week of our New Beginning Sermon Series, our January series. Now, last week, Pastor John got us uh, off to a great start uh, with one of the first stories in the Bible, the story of Adam and Eve from Genesis chapter 3. It's a story uh, about the tendency for we humans to sort of pass the blame and instead of taking responsibility. But as Pastor John pointed out, it's also a story of God's amazing grace and God's presence in our lives, even when we make some questionable decisions. Well, today we jump into a book that doesn't get preached on very often, the book of Joshua. This new beginning involves replacing an icon, stepping into big shoes uh, while fulfilling an even bigger task. Now, you may not know much about it, but the book of Joshua is referred to or quoted directly from 14 other places in the Bible. Jerome Creech, in his interpretation commentary on Joshua, says the book of Joshua is one of the Bible's greatest testimonies to the mighty acts of God on behalf of Israel. Yale Divinity School professor Carolyn Sharp in her Smith and Helwey's commentary gives even more uh, detail in her praise. And she writes, this book is theologically powerful, characterizing the covenant people as eager to obey Yahweh and showing their God as one who is mighty to save, a, a deity who keeps promises from of old. Joshua chapter 1, the first two verses. After the death of Moses, a servant of the Lord, the Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, My servant Moses is dead. Now proceed to cross the Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I am giving to them, to the Israelites. So this call by God to proceed to cross the Jordan, this is a fulfillment of a promise that God made way, way back in the book of Genesis to Abraham. Genesis 15, 5 has the following exchange between God and this childless octogenarian at the time. God brought Abraham outside and said, look toward the heavens and count the stars if you're able to count them. Then he said to him, so shall your descendants be. And then God goes on to tell Abraham that he will give him land for his future descendants to settle in so that they can dwell in safety. And that promise, that land had come to be known as the promised land, right? Promised by God to Abraham's offspring. Well, let's fast forward hundreds of years, and out of Egypt, God calls Moses through a burning bush to be the one to help lead the Hebrew people into that promised land. And after 10 plagues, Moses leads the people across through the Red Sea and speaks face to face with God. And Moses receives the law on Mount Sinai where the Ten Commandments are a portion of the instructions, the commandments that God gave to Moses. And then for 40 years, Moses and the people live in the wilderness. And God decided that for a variety of reasons, Moses and his compatriots would not actually make it into the promised land themselves. That would be reserved for the next generation, the younger people of Israel moving into the land. Carolyn Sharp writes, Israel had come to a sense of itself as Yahweh, or God's covenant people, in the wilderness. That is to say, the Israelites came to understand who they were, a people formed by obedience and justice, as the law was inscribed on stone tablets atop Sinai. They had faced dire threats and been surprised by grace more times than they could count. Moses, prophet without equal, had led them all the way. Now with Joshua at the head, Israel goes forward to lay claim to the promise that had kept them moving through fear and thirst and near starvation. 
the promise of a land flowing with milk and honey, a land of abundance where they could safely settle and flourish. Which takes us back to Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, My servant Moses is dead. Now proceed to cross the Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I am giving them to the Israelites. So Joshua has really, really big shoes to fill, stepping in after an amazing amount of leadership and time that Moses had put in. Not only that, but Joshua has been given the opportunity to also be part of God's fulfillment of the promise to the great father Abraham, entering the promised land with God's people. What an amazing opportunity. Verses 3 to 5. Every place, God says, that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, as I promised Moses. From the wilderness and the Lebanon as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, and all the land of the Hittites to the great sea in the west, that shall be your territory. No one shall be able to stand against you for all the days of your life. And as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. Now, if we didn't know anything about what was to come after this, This sounds very encouraging and comforting, doesn't it? Right? I mean, it kind of reminds me, everywhere your foot touches will be yours. It kind of reminds me of this scene from The Lion King, right? Remember that? When when, uh, Mufasa tells Simba, everything that the light touches is our kingdom, right? And then God lays out the parameters geographically, and God tells Joshua that no one will be able to stand against you. And and he finishes with the promise that he made to Moses, uh, saying that I will be with you. I mean, what is not to like about this? Well, you see, the problem that many people have with the book of Joshua is that it advocates and even says that God dictates the destruction of the Canaanites as part of the conquest of moving into this land. In fact, one commentator I read this week said, The ancient literature espouses unbridled, militarized violence by Israel against inhabitants of Canaanite territories. Karen Lynn Sharp writes, Those who follow the Prince of Peace, along with all communities that seek the sacred, have a spiritual obligation to resist and decry practices of brutality wherever those things are encountered. From the Christian Crusades against the Muslims, 1095 to 1291, and countless other religious wars that have been fought over the years, to the centuries of torture and execution inflicted by the Spanish Inquisition, to the pogroms against Jews in both medieval and modern times, to the lynchings of our African-American brothers and sisters before and up through the civil rights movement in this country, even the genocidal inter-ethnic conflicts of Rwanda and Bosnia. Not only were all of these atrocities committed through violent economic, social, and religious practices, but as Carolyn Sharp says, also through the force of brutal rhetoric that worked to dehumanize particular groups and to shame those who would stand in alliance with them. So yes, we must move with fear and trembling as we enter the book of Joshua. Jerome Creech invites us to read Joshua primarily as theological literature and not as history in the modern sense of the word. You see, the book wasn't written while these experiences were taking place. It was written centuries after the actual events, when the Israelites were coming out of their own exile in Babylon and returning back to their homeland. The Hebrew word for violence, Hamas, has a slightly different connotation than the English word, violence. In the Old Testament, violence uh, principally refers to actions that tear at the fabric of Israelite society by defying the sovereignty of God, like physically attacking one's own neighbor, a person who was made in the image of God, or uh, when someone rapes another person's wife or daughter. The Old Testament detests these types of violence, and in fact, there are specific laws against them in the Old Testament. The tragedies related to warfare, however, are actually not classified as violence unless the war is motivated by human arrogance, which is different from uh, a war related to self-defense or, as many people refer to, a just war. So to take 
Joshua straight up as history, uh, one would see it as a historical account of what the Israelite army actually did moving into Canaan. But the reality is quite different. The battle reports that we find in the book are, as Dr. Creech puts it, uh, mostly aggrandized by authors living centuries after the events. You see, Joshua's audience had a history littered with experiences of themselves being victimized, made homeless, enslaved, and controlled by the major empires of their day. By the time the book of Joshua was actually completed, both Israel and Judah, the northern and southern kingdoms of Israel, had been attacked, politically and militarily exploited, and exiled by the likes of Egypt, Babylon, and Assyria. So many scholars today believe that the details we find in Joshua were exaggerated as a response to the reality of what Israel had recently been put through at the time of the writing. Now, all that to say, I, 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 I'm expecting that some people may have a problem with what I just said because it's the Bible, right? And the Bible is the word of God. And yes, I fully and heartily believe the Bible is the word of God. It's God's word as penned by human beings, inspired by the Holy Spirit, who did their best to encapsulate how they experienced God in their own lives and context. Thomas Long, in his book, The Witness of Preaching, writes this, We go to scripture then not to glean a set of facts about God or of the faith that can be then announced whenever and wherever, but to encounter a presence, to hear God's voice, speaking to us ever anew, calling us in the midst of situations in which we find ourselves to be God's faithful people. So instead of getting hung up on whether this was actual history or historical literature, let us use this story to encounter the presence of the Almighty God. Verse 6. Be strong and courageous, for you shall put this people in possession of the land that I swore to their ancestors to give them. So given what we heard earlier from God, right, everywhere your foot touches uh, will be given to you and no one will be able to stand against you, doesn't it seem a bit strange that God has to follow up with these words of encouragement to Joshua? I mean, wouldn't you think that God's pretty much uh, already guaranteed victory and he kind of just cruise moving forward into this new chapter of Israel's life? In our staff meeting every week, we read the scripture that's coming up and we talk about it. And Don uh, was saying that he thought this was God's way of implying that uh, it's going to be kind of challenging. It's going to be difficult, uh, despite the reassurances that God gave Joshua. I can totally see that. that the, the Hebrews will have to face battle after battle as they settle into this promised land, a land that has already been settled by people living in the region. But maybe there's something more to this verse. Maybe there's something deeper within Joshua that God is seeking to get at and encourage. Maybe Joshua is questioning whether or not he can do this task that's been given him. I mean, Moses was God's servant. In fact, the phrase that we heard in verse 1, Moses, servant of the Lord, that's used 18 times in the book of Joshua. Moses, Servant of the Lord. You know how many times it says Joshua, servant of the Lord? Just once. The rest of the time, Joshua, Moses' assistant. Yeah. At the end of Moses' life, we get this passage from Deuteronomy 24. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His sight was unimpaired and his vigor had not abated. Never since has there arisen a prophet in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. Yeah, no pressure, Joshua. It's now your turn, right? And though he was a seasoned warrior and a lifelong sidekick to Moses, Joshua was untested in his executive decision-making at this moment in the story. Does he have what it takes to be the next Moses? I just started reading this book, Limitless, by Jim Quick. You've got to love the subtitle. It says... Upgrade your brain, learn anything faster, and unlock your exceptional life. Well, in the book, Jim Quick references the work done by Dr. Janice Vilhauer. She's the director of Emory University's Adult Outpatient Psychotherapy Program in the School of Medicine. And in her book, Thinking Forward to Thrive, Dr. Vilhauer talks about how we are often our own worst enemy. 
She writes, the voice in your head that judges you, doubts you, belittles you, constantly tells you you're not good enough. It says negative, hurtful things to you, things that you would never even dream of saying to anyone else. I'm such an idiot. I'm a phony. I never do anything right. I will never succeed. That inner critic is not harmless. It inhibits you, limits you. It stops you from pursuing the life that you truly want to live. It robs you of peace of mind and emotional well-being. And if left unchecked long enough, it can even lead to serious mental health problems like depression and anxiety. I think there's a <clears throat> very real possibility that Joshua was dealing with his own self-doubt on the eve of heading into the promised land as he's facing this daunting task of having to follow in Moses' footsteps as the new leader of Israel. I mean, Moses was prophet, liberator, lawgiver, commander, judge, all rolled into the one. How do you top that? The reality is you don't because you can't. There will never be another Moses. Deuteronomy 34 said that. All Joshua can do is be the best Joshua that he knows how to be. And evidently, God knew he was going to take a little bit of encouragement along the way. I joked at our staff meeting this week that it's kind of like Jeannie taking over from Inga after so many years being the office administrator, right? But the reality is Jeannie is doing a great job as she finds her own way to represent the church just as Inga did for so many years. But probably a more appropriate comparison would be when I came here in 2015 after Jim Powell had served this church faithfully for 24 years. Right? Jim 1.0, as he likes to be called. Do not call him old Jim. It gets under his skin. Jim 1.0 led this church for almost a quarter of a century. And under his leadership, this church grew and flourished in membership and discipleship. Under his leadership, we purchased 15 acres of property on 15th Street West to one day build a new sanctuary. That was the, the vision at the time. Under his leadership, this church was at its financial peak in terms of giving and stewardship, and then I came along. I jokingly tell people, I've been doing a fabulous job over the last nine years of shrinking the membership of the church and the budget over the time of my tenure here. Uh, I mean, the truth is, Jim told me that the trends were changing. He had already seen it in the last few years while he was leading here. The church was moving into a transition. But you can see where I'm getting at, right? It, it's difficult replacing a beloved and successful leader, no matter who you are, no matter what gifts and skills God has given you. And, and, and even though the church has shrunk in many of the ways that I've mentioned, I also think we've grown in a number of ways, especially in our openness and welcoming spirit as we have been inspired by Jesus to love. Verses 7 and 8. Only be strong and very courageous, says God, being careful to act in accordance with all the law that my servant Moses commanded you. Do not turn, to, uh, turn from it to the right hand or to the left so that you may be successful wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. You shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to act in accordance with all that is written in it. For then you shall make your way prosperous and then you shall be successful. There it is again, right? Be strong and courageous. Evidently, Joshua ne really needs that reassurance from God. But God follows it up with, what, uh, with a call to keep focused on the law of Moses. That would be referring to the divine instruction that God gave Moses up on Mount Sinai, which included uh, the Ten Commandments, but gave so much more. And God's just saying, remember it, recite it, take it to heart, live it out in your life, says God. And what a wonderful reminder is for all of us, right, that God has called us to be people who have Scripture as a priority in our lives. We need to spend time reading and journaling and meditating on the Bible. That's why uh, from, from when I first got here, Scripture journaling has been a part of, of this ministry. It's, we have it every week in our staff meeting, and we have it in our um, uh, many of our committee meetings begin with Scripture journaling. Monday and Tuesday mornings, you can join us online for Scripture journaling. There's a difference between reading the Bible for information, which is important, and reading the Bible for transformation, where we begin to apply what we're reading into our lives. When we meditate on the words of Scripture, we become more and more like Jesus. 
And I love it how God doesn't choose this time before Joshua heads in to give him, you know, last minute military strategy. Like, here's what you're going to need to know before you go. He doesn't give Joshua a, a, a list of tasks that he's going to have to accomplish in his first 100 days of leadership. No. What does God ask him to do? Pay attention to the law. Focus on scripture. Be obedient to what I've already shared with you of what it means how to live your life. So for Joshua, that was following the laws that Moses had written down. But if you take a closer look at what's found in the book of Deuteronomy, which lists all of that that God gave to Moses, you'll find a collection of ways that Israel can express their love for God and one another with all their heart and soul and mind and strength. It's a call to justice and equality while giving God one's full allegiance. And if you do this, says God, then no matter what happens, you'll be successful. And then it finishes in verse 9. I hereby command you, be strong and courageous. And do not be frightened or dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Right? He finishes again with a third time telling Joshua to be strong and courageous and reminding him, no matter what happens, I will be with you. James Howell, in the Storyteller's Companion to the Bible commentary, makes this very insightful comment. He writes, In a meaningful sense, Israel never came into the land. I mean, they came in, but their fidelity did not match God's gift. In just a few centuries, they lost the land. For most of history, Jews have remained outside the land, sojourners, aliens, not yet home. The story presents each generation with the same choice offered to that first generation. We always wait, poised to receive God's gifts, challenged to live a life commensurate with those gifts. The promised land was not something that God asked Joshua and Israel to take, no, God said, this has been given to you. There's a difference between taking something and receiving it as a gift. So no matter where we find ourselves today in new opportunities or new positions of leadership, whether we're taking over from someone like Inga or Jim Powell or Moses, or maybe we're just simply living into whatever role or relationship God had already given us, and we're continuing in that in this new year. As we start 2024, as we look at new beginnings, even if we're doing the same old thing, we have an opportunity to start anew. Can we recognize not only that God is with us, but that God stands ready to give us some good gifts? It may not be a new coaching position or a new land to possess, but there is some task, I believe, that God has given each and every one of us at this season in our lives. And undoubtedly, there will be many challenges that we face along the way. So, be strong and courageous, God says to us. And may we also quiet those voices inside our heads, telling us that we're not good enough. May our hearts and our minds be open to wherever this road may take us, even if it's a bit uncertain, because we know that God is with us. And that he gives us the powerful words of scripture to guide our paths, if only we'll use it. New beginnings are all around us, friends. Be strong and courageous. Amen. I invite you to rise as we sing our closing hymn for today. Number 578, God of Power and God of Love. Or God of Love and God of Power.
here in person, before you leave, in our lobby are some cards. Now, traditionally, those cards have been for people that are unable to get out to church, or maybe they're going through a recent loss of a loved one, or maybe a sickness or an illness. But in the new year, uh, one of the things that Miss Jeannie has decided to do is to uh, send cards to everyone. So if you just got a card and you're wondering what bad thing is happening in my life for me to get this card, no, 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 it's just a new beginning, right? We're, so on your way out, go sign cards to people you know and love. Just sign your name and that'd be great. And while you're at it, join us in the social hall for fellowship, uh, for light refreshments, and uh, as we say in Hawaii, talk story uh, a little bit. As we get ready to go, whether you're here in person or worshiping online, know that God is with you. Be strong and courageous wherever this week may go as you seek to not only be inspired by Jesus to love, but to seek first the kingdom of God. Go to be God's beloved, chosen, blessed people to be a blessing to others. Amen. Thank you.